This is the Open University. Welcome to the Open University and welcome back me. Welcome back to what this platform allows me, which is to talk in my apartment. First of all, that's an amazing liberty, uh, since liberty is going to be the theme of this talk. Um, to give yourself a pretext for just talking aloud is in itself uh, to issue a kind of license. That's a legalistic term, but we talk about license for freedom. Uh, as if there was some sort of mechanism of the law which issued licenses permitting you to have liberties in limited areas. Um, I find the whole thing fascinating. Uh, life is a series, and I'm sort of making a narrative of my life just now in, in making this memoir called Niche, which will appear next year. And looking at my life as a kind of bulb fish um, squirting sand, oh, that's a strange metaphor, um, a kind of uh, flux of liberty where I have more or less space to kind of mull things over. Um, I've made a lot of decisions um, to, and they're, they're trade-offs each time, because often when you uh, choose liberty for yourself, you give up connectedness. This seems to be a, a kind of universal law that um, you can have freedom off on a limb when you go solo, for instance, um, when I had a band, uh, I had a connectedness with the other members of the band, and we had a collective force as five musicians playing things. Um, but I chose ultimately to become a solo artist because I had more liberty as a solo artist to um, make the kind of music I wanted to make and to, to use each um, arrangement uh, much more precisely than I could have done just uh, sort of farming it out to a bass player or a drummer or whatever. I really wanted to get my hands dirty with the, the grammar of drumming and what it could be rather than what it kind of was out there in the world. I, I, it was a sort of arrogance too because I believed that I could come up with more interesting drum patterns. Um, I wasn't as coordinated as any of the drummers I worked with. Um, but I, I kind of wanted that clumsiness, even the, the, the lack of coordination could, be, could become a personal style. And that would be much more interesting for me to express you know, the, the rhythms of my nervous system through my own music. So um, that's one example. Um, a more recent example, because I've, in the book I've got up to the year 2002, I'm in Tokyo and I'm making um, Oscar Tennis Champion, which is the first of my so-called O Trilogy. Oscar, Otto, and uh, Oki, and um, it's, it's the most avant-garde and experimental I've been up until that point, and um, I'm kind of, I'm in Japan, and that in itself is a whole different situation of liberty. Japan, uh, living in Tokyo, um, as a foreigner, you're not really expected to um, conform to all the codes, to all the obligations and duties and restrictions that Japanese people are expected to conform to. So you're in a, a sort of condition of tremendous liberty. And um, one tends, I tend to exploit that. <clears throat> Sometimes, you know, going to the limits of what that might allow me to do. It's kind of invisibility, though. I don't know. There is, that confers a kind of liberty on you to make gaffes, you know, to, to sort of be in it but not of it. But um, it also, it, it's like being the invisible man, or it's like being able to walk through buildings. I mean, that would be great for a while, perhaps for a day. But then you would think, well, what's the point? I, I just seem to live in a kind of nebulous world where I don't count, I don't matter, I, I don't have any physical presence anymore. I don't have any social presence anyway. Um, I'm not seen as a, a member of the community. And in Japan, that's tremendously important to be part of the team, to be part of the community that harmonious uh, reiwa. Reiwa is the name of the new era, of course, and it, it, rei means um, um, strength, I think, and, and wa means harmony. The spirit of wa is basically the name for Japan. Um, it's an alternative name for Japan. Wa means we're all together, we're harmonious, and um, we don't give each other liberty in that condition. Liberty is, a, I suppose, it's a kind of Western fetish. It's something I've always... Um, fallen for, though. So anyway, yeah, I was going to talk about Tokyo in 2002. Um, I was in a relationship. I was there, uh, invited by 
Shizu, my girlfriend at the time, who was a fantastic girlfriend, and um, she she was someone who gave me a lot of liberties, um, liberty in allowing me to flirt with other women and, and um, actually encouraging me to do that. Uh, she was very adventurous. And um, so the first thing she did when she took an apartment in Nakameguro in 2002 was invite her, her best friend from school, Chie, to come and live with us to help with the rent. And we just had one futon, so we were all sleeping, three of us on a single futon each night. And um, I was allowed to sleep in the middle. I was given this liberty of sleeping in the middle. Um, so, you know, <laughs> it'd be wandering, not my wandering hands, but other, other wandering hands, and one would never quite know whose hands they were, but, um, which was amusing. But in the second year, um, somebody else um, became a flatmate, and um, uh, Chie got married and moved out. And uh, this second person was less, um, less reliable, uh, not less reliable, um, was considered dangerous because it was... Um, I don't know, there was some more flirtatious kind of situation there. And um, so I was uh, banished from the futon and I had to sleep on a kind of dog basket outside, and no, not outside, in, in the other room, through some sliding doors. So um, I, I guess, was that, was that an increase of liberty or, or not? I mean, what I did, in that, because I, that started to rankle, that I was actually um, I kicked out like that. So I, I, I went off and had a coffee with a girl in, in a cafe called the Giggle Cafe, a DJ I'd met in the 90s, um, and she, she kind of seduced me and um, we had a, started having an affair. So I would ha start to take a, a, the Chuo line across to Nishiyogi Kubo and uh, to, to spend time in her room. And there I encountered all sorts of music and amazing stuff, and it was a kind of freedom, a kind of liberty for me to be able to go, to have somewhere else to go. Because when you're self-employed like me and you work at home, you know, my home studio was where I was recording Oscar Tennis Champion. Um, it's actually quite an amazing thing to have a room to go to across town. I called it the White Room. Uh, it was a small white studio apartment in a nondescript suburban kind of area, but um, it felt glamorous to me to get on a train kind of clandestinely and go across to another part of town and have this other relationship with someone who was um, um, who was cute, <laughs> and but also introduced me to a lot of uh, music, um, like uh, Miharu Koshi and um, the um, Haruo Mihosono's um, commercials music. It's called coincidental music in the box set, which he made in about 1984-85 for various TV commercials and commercial applications. Great music, very strange and, and clunky and kind of um, early sampling -y, really formative influence on my sound. So, you know, it was kind of calling me. It was crucial for me to, to seize that liberty. It's not always honorable, you know, to, to do that. You know, you, we, we have bad motives for, for seizing our liberty. We can be perverse, we can be adulterous and all the rest. I wasn't married, but, you know... Um, it was the beginning of the breakdown of that relationship, and therefore it was the beginning of the end of my Tokyo, of that particular Tokyo stay, because I left at the end of 2002, essentially left Japan, uh, went back to Europe, and then started a new life, initially in Paris and then in Berlin, here in Berlin. But this liberty theme, I mean, it, you know, obviously it's a huge political issue as well at the moment because we have a prime minister in Britain who's actually making a virtue of ending freedom of movement. Uh, this thing which has been an absolutely essential part of my life because I've been living, when not in Japan, I've been living in continental Europe. And um, to have this brandished as some kind of amazing benefit or virtue that Britain is, that Britons will no longer have freedom of movement to live where they want in, in continental Europe is just such a bizarre reversal. Uh, but we're seeing these reversals in many, unfortunately, many areas of modern life, um, including the internet, where it, it used to be that you would have amazing freedom of choice, um, or freedom of expression, rather, through the web. Um, now, whenever I go on the web, I seem to get immediate pop-ups saying, you know, are you sure that you want to allow us to look at your cookies and all the rest of it, um, which, is a, which is an irritation and an annoyance. But, of course, there's legislation going through the the EU right now about um, copyright um, 
on various platforms, which will restrict um, a huge amount of uh, what we do in our regular daily commerce on websites and on the internet, because a lot of that material is rather dubious in copyright-wise. As an artist and as a copyright holder, I should be in favour of this legislation, but I'm not, because what I'm favor in favour of mostly is freedom. My freedom as an artist to use material which I can find readily and easily online is going to be vastly restricted by, by that. I don't believe in copyright being policed to that extent. I think it's gone way too far. Um, I'm generally in favour of the European project, but this is where I, I think they've really slipped and stumbled. And even people like the Wikimedia Foundation are, are very much against this. So um, another, another area that's an, an interesting example of liberty becoming restricted is the subject of my last video. I, I made a video called Trottinette about how much fun I was having on my electric scooter in Paris. And I was complaining about Berlin being behind Paris because Berlin has legislated or is in the process of legislating against these things and saying that you must have insurance, you must have a helmet, you must have lights, you must be over a certain age, um, etc., etc. And they can't go on the pavement and they can't also go on the road with the traffic. They must only go and cycle. You know, they really restricted these devices, which are a fantastic leap forward in terms of taking cars off the road, um, battling on the city streets for control. Which kind of vehicles are we going to allow to dominate our cities in the future? I think electric scooters and all small electrical mobility devices, which are zero emissions, are a great step forward. Unfortunately, the legislators are, are seemingly doing their best to um, stymie and restrict kneecap these devices. Um, and Paris, uh, France has also just passed new legislation which will end the free-for-all which has been existing in Paris of these um, scooters being able to go on the pavement, for instance. Um, they're going to cap the speed at 25 kilometers per hour, which is fine. That's about all they do anyway at the moment. It's just going to be much more, there's going to be much more hassle from the police in future if you're riding in the wrong place, the wrong time, with the wrong clothing, you know, etc., etc. So it's not quite as restrictive as the German legislation. This is, a, again, you'd think the European project would make a sort of blanket legislation for these vehicles and would have an enlightened policy towards their energy use and their benefits and things, but it's not. It's a very peaceful meal. It's city by city, mayor by mayor, and also country by country, and this kind of, this endless um, grey area about um, selective application, um, you know, that legislation might be tabled about these things, but then it really depends on what the police actually do. I mean, the Paris um, scooters have been uh, forbidden to go on pavements since last September, but the police do not enforce that. I've gone past many police officers. That's really the crunch point. When you go past a police officer on the pavement, or with two people on a scooter, which, by the way, is being banned from September of, next, of this year, um, whether the policeman will stop you and whether, having stopped you, they will simply give you a friendly warning or whether they will actually fine you. This is what selective application is all about. Politicians, if you think about it, all they can really do is just generate legislation. But really, the crunch point, the important thing, is whether that is applied on the ground, whether one has to, as an, as an Internet company, putting up you know, user content which might contain copyright, you actually go in and block it, uh, you know, do what Tumblr did very stupidly recently and, and block all sorts of things with stupid algorithms that completely misidentified breasts and, you know, apparently sexual things. Um, all sorts of photos on my Tumblr were blocked and I appealed all these and they were all immediately revoked because they were not sexual content. Um, but we live in an age of twitchiness and of moral... Um, a kind of moral torpor or terror, I don't know which it is, a kind of, um, it's not an age of liberty, it's not an age, you know, if you look at the 60s and 70s, it's much more, um, actually a very interesting thing I was studying recently was Barney Rossett and the history of the Grove Press in America and how feminism actually um, destroyed the Grove Press. The Grove Press was doing very well after all the pro publicity they got in the 60s from high profile anti-censorship cases, it, was, it seemed like a no-brainer that uh, one should battle the censors, in the 60s anyway, one should battle the censors of books like, um, uh, you know, The Tropic of Cancer by Henry Miller, Lady Chatley's Lover by D.H. Lawrence, and um, 
and beat them because they're obviously works of literary value and, you know, there's no way to say that they're under, undermining public morals or, you know, even turning people on particularly. They're, they're literary works. Um, but then what really undermined the Grove Press was from about 1972, I think when, um, was it Kate Millett uh, uh, started attacking this as a project to promote old white men, basically, who were, you know, like Henry Miller, who was by then a very old man, like a dirty old man. And to say that this was a, a patriarchal kind of um, liberty, which did not actually help women, uh, which obviously people like Anais Nin would have disagreed with entirely, but um, she was not one of their um, favorite authors, I guess. So this, th this actually, uh, Grove Press, you know, at a certain point in, in the early 70s, had a fantastic building in, in Soho, I think it was, in New York. Um, but as soon as this kind of the tide turned and feminism, this Puritan moment of feminism actually took over, the Grove Press actually uh, had to move to smaller and smaller offices and basically went out of business. It was never the same again anyway. Uh, so there was this sense that it had, had gone from the good guys to the bad guys overnight, pretty much overnight. So, yeah, different interpretations of liberty. Um, it does seem very much that nobody's particularly interested in... Uh, in liberty, and I think I, I've spent a lot of my time uh, online trying to locate value, trying to locate instances, the things, things which give you that rush of that sense of liberty, a sense of there being possibilities that are, are there to be used. Things of value, though, things of spiritual value, and things of um, artistic value. So um, I've kind of retreated to old paperbacks, you know. Um, this is the latest one I got. This is um, Vidal Gombrowicz's um, Jungfraulichkeit, which I got for two euros yesterday in a bookshop here in Berlin. Um, young girlishness, <laughs> which is already a risky title because, of course, we have huge anxiety about um, where exactly the boundary between children and adults is. What are the rights of children? What are the rights of adults? When do you gain liberty? When, when is your age of majority when you can vote and kill people in wars and all the rest of it and have sexual intercourse or be a sexual creature at all because we don't really follow Freud's idea that children are sexual from birth. So of course this, the, the lead essay in here, he's talking about um, Jungfraulichkeit, um, young girlishness. Um, so young girlishness um, signs, signals that each thing uh, has a different meaning. Uh, is animated by a different meaning than it seems to have. Oh, another thing, another interesting thing recently from the news is um, uh, a, a report a couple of days ago in The Guardian saying that British people are having almost no sex now, very little sex. If you look at the, um, the people who've had more than 10 instances of sexual intercourse per month, it's about 10% of the British population. I find myself in that 10%, at my, even at my advanced age, or maybe I'm a relic of a previously more sexual age. Apparently young people are much less interested in sex, and um, Japanese people and British people uh, have lost their interest in sex. I don't know really what's going on there, but um, it is apparently um, a sort of minority interest now. We've sort of de we're, uh, Young people are drinking less alcohol, having less sex, all the sort of things which we considered liberties worth fighting for in the 60s, for instance, with the permissive revolution, the sexual revolution, have um, people have been peddling back from ever since, it seems, either actively in the sort of uh, Mary Whitehouse way, or just sort of, you know, with a shrug. Apparently, according to this article in The Guardian, it's because people are on their phones all the time. In other words, swiping is more interesting than sex. I think I did have a blog post once about how I could understand that perspective because I'm I myself in, in a sort of long-term relationship as I was in the noughties, for instance, um, found myself more interested in, in the internet. Now that seems like a golden age because, God, the internet's boring. I, I really feel there's very little of interest. Um, I, I still feel obligated to kind of sit there looking at it for large parts of the day, trying to find something interesting. What I find is depressing things about my shrinking liberty and um, <laughs> new legislation going through to, to shrink it even more. All this stuff, in Britain, people are going to have to register to look at pornography 
within the next month or two. Isn't that amazing? Isn't that absolutely amazing? Look at what the 90s did for pornography and for sexual awareness and sexual kind of um, knowledge. Um, and now we're, we're, we're stepping back from that, and our British people are, and saying, you know, we want one of these endless registers. Let's register for your right to stay in Britain if you're not British, if you're born in continental Europe, and let's register for your right to look at, por- to look at naked bodies on the internet. Isn't that pathetic? Isn't, aren't we going in a pathetic direction? I really find that um, tragic and sad, and it makes me angry, um, that liberty is so, uh, so much threatened on all these levels. Um, but yeah, to me it's just uh, to be a tourist in a bubble where people don't quite know that you're working on something, they just think you're, you're there on a tourist visa. After, after if, there is a, if there is a Brexit and we lose this right of freedom of movement, I will be here in Berlin as a tourist or somewhere else as a tourist and I'll just be getting on with my work. And a great big fuck you to those people who are pulling back liberty, like, a, like tugging a Chinese rug from out under my feet. I will stand on whatever is under the rug, and then when you pull that out, whatever it is, the grass, perhaps you'll wither and destroy the grass. I will stand on the bare soil. Open University. 